In the beginning, there were the states and territories looking after people with disabilities. And unobserved, all was well, until it wasn't. Which was when it was observed. Well, it was well, but when looked upon, it was frowned upon. The people were unhappy, especially those with a disability, and yet the coffers were alarmingly quite empty. This perplexed many as to how so much could be spent with so little reward in outcome. Had we not closed the institutions? Had we not had enough telethons? Indeed, even Tip Top had sponsored some with clothing and, of course, glorious finger buns. Yet, the overlapped and interlocking system was astonishingly somehow inefficient and so a new idea was born. The eagerness and excitement of the idea transcended any idea of how or what when we clearly now possessed the why. Of course, it was the right thing to do and no one could argue especially it was the right thing, even though we hadn't agreed on what the thing was that we were doing. It was right. It is in no doubt the best idea, in fact. It was the bestest idea. However, ideas don't float well without substance. They just float away. Pretty soon, ripples of discontent became tsunamis. Like all eager gold miners, many rushed to stake their claim. Amongst pandemic inflation and global financial crisis, I mean, who could really lay the blame on anyone when everyone was indeed so signalling so virtuously well to possess the vision? Did we all not possess the same vision? Forgive me, what was it again? Some were not fortunate and were left out in the cold, outside of the vision, disabled but abandoned in such deafening silence, only our hearts could hear them. If the moment was right, or perhaps on a 7.30 report, children who struggled in the schools deemed superfluous and destined to such hard lives because they needed help, which schools didn't do. The elderly abandoned to stoically rot and far less than their counterparts who were less disabled but younger. It perplexed them how choice and control and living your best life had suddenly changed to six-minute showers and God's waiting room. Those with troubled minds left to the torture of their thoughts with not even a hope to pull themselves out. So many left parched with a thirst greater than ever, the thirst for survival. They sought any refuge they could. Are they to blame? There were those made to feel guilty for how many times they opened their bowels. Counted in sense, made no sense. Those struggling with families to care for themselves and their sanity in a world that could only be seen as in conflict with the one we lived in. Houses so expensive, we feel like the only ones not good enough to live in one. Yet so many suffer in solidarity in their insecurity, unaware of how more alike they are than separate. Those who travelled far in search of survival and promises of soft fruit, who found exploitation and misery in our land of sunlit plains and plenty. The cowboys made hay, so much hay it rotted in their fields. Yet no great and glorious vision had manifested, well not the NDIS vision, whatever it was. There were even those who spoke for others and stole their voices straight from their mouths, who shared a different vision, their own. Yet it was somehow the same story for all concerned, the story older than us, older than us all, one of survival and by the only means before us, taken with both hands. We blamed the government, we blamed each other, so the people blamed each other and all were right. Only when it hit the fan and all were thoroughly covered in it, did we conclude that the shit had indeed hit the fan. So the people all got together and some said they hadn't seen the shit, but clearly had, and others said they hadn't seen it nearly enough. Yet we concluded that we needed to solve the problem of the vision. It had to be sustainable, but for who? It had to give outcomes, but what? It had to go on, but few understood exactly why. And even fewer knew how each as passionate as the other, the agreeing in disagreement, eventually halted the NDIS universe. And not even Tin Tams could save it. To me, it would seem quite clear that the issue, which was the issue before, and still is the issue now, is the question of just what is the vision? 
It is affordability for the people? Well, yes, it is that. Is it affordability for the people? Well, yes. Is it that it is profitable for those that facilitate? Well, yes, also necessary. Is it to meet some lofty ideal or agenda? Perhaps. But the thread interwoven is the entirely necessary outcome. The grease to the wheels of all our engines, which is the human outcome. Those who need our help to be lifted beyond their care, to seek out if they so choose to have a life worth living. That is the vision and the compulsion of our nature, our survival and our species. It is the human right, the right that transcends all others being the right to life. Our survival, our suffering, our humanity and shared endurance of life is what we all unavoidably share and what binds us in an unspoken solidarity. This is the story of the NDIS in finding the right question and solving that question to give us an answer. And no, sadly, it isn't 42. Even though it is as many days and a few more that the back on track bill has been delayed. So whilst the great government computer calculates the answer again, at least for another 42 days, we await the outcome. What is the answer? Will the NDIS survive? Which is for many their life, their universe and their everything. In the beginning, rather than overhaul the entire system and root out the bad players, they decided to reinvigorate with a huge purple band-aid, kind of like wallpapering over dry rot. They sounded world-leading and revolutionary, and we all congratulated ourselves enormously. I mean, what could be better than diverting the gays away from failure and the states from their financial woes and eagerness to palm off disability? What could be better than rooting out all the fraud and the huge gaps in care than purple sprinkles and a, an emotional feel-good makeover. Let's just give this area a little bit of a zhuzh. Make it sound world-leading and the old issues just go away, right? To reinvigorate the invigorated in an enthusiastic manner and magically undertake a countrywide change management plan in a rollout. As seeping ever-gorging tired of custard that eventually enveloped the nation. We didn't know to what extent what was done, and who did what and what it cost, in part or whole, or indeed to whom and for how many what needed to be done and just how much hadn't been done before. We decided to take all those participants' files and make them invisible, or lose them for those who became providers in the scheme, which is just as well, because those entering wouldn't have understood what they said anyway so it nicely avoided any embarrassment. Those that did would not have tread had they known the risks they thought so. Better this way for them. Let their enthusiasm carry them. Plus, it excitingly made case management more like a game of Cluedo. That is, of course, when case management occurred. The greatest magic of all was all of those people with disabilities that had needed case management suddenly didn't. We didn't need anybody to know anything or be trained in anything because we now had choice and control, which is kind of like a magical, hypnotic buyer beware, only the buyer demands it as their right. If the participant was unaware of what they needed, they wouldn't know if they weren't getting it. It was better if they knew what it was that they wanted. It was as if by will and a tad smidge of ignorance, everyone was suddenly no longer in need of care. Instead, they set out to bring in very expensive cleaning contractors. All that was needed was your person out of bed and cleaned thoroughly and several hundred scrolls of Facebook and all would be well. That was until it wasn't. Despite the repetitive reciting of codes of conduct and articles of human rights, like mantras, it astonished us all that these rights and outcomes didn't transpire. Why had they not just risen up and joined employment? Why had they not performed as if not disabled? Had we not repeated capacity building as an ever-positive phrase to them? You see, 
nobody had known what everyone knew, that someone had to know what they had to do. So many had not known, which meant nobody knew who did know to ask who knew. So they didn't know, they didn't know, and no one wanted to tell them. In addition, quite curiously, despite fair warning that people with disabilities were, in fact, actually people, it astonished everyone that handling large budgets or buckets of money was quite difficult. Despite this being known, it was not known or recognised, and it shocked many that this had become an issue. So many had no idea what they were doing amongst those for whom they were doing it, who did not know how to manage those who didn't know what they were managing in any case. Eventually, it became so much money that it got the attention of those in charge of the money when they went to buy some submarines and had to give an IOU. In addition, though they had decided because it had suited their budgets just how many they would be catering for at a national disability lunch, they forgot the lunch was free. And so many more would of course be attending. So they didn't have enough for those that hadn't eaten because it offended those who always ate to have to share. What they didn't calculate was that government money would attract so many cowboys or that not regulating services and access to said government money would attract them in such numbers. On top of the failure to calculate that people with disabilities were still people, first and foremost, this had created the perfect example of clusterfuck, often named but rarely seen in such purity of example. So the government, the representatives of those with disabilities and the people and the providers decided to have a grand royal commission. The results, after costing $600 million, were that it was not good. So the government of the day decided it would be only right to conduct a review, separate to that, of just people with a disability, but those just those on the NDIS. They travelled, they talked, they gave speeches and they listened. Those that represented the people on the NDIS with a disability felt that though they had spoken and the government had listened, that they hadn't done it right, and so they did it again. Reform, more commonly known as a do-over, would be the order of the day, frequently followed by an election and often a parliamentary reshuffle. The NDIS became so extremely complicated that people needed interpreters, more commonly known as advocates. What they had discovered was that the states had clearly misunderstood the NDIS and thought that it meant they had whisked away everyone with a disability to some place of forgetting. They had indeed forgotten that they still had some four million people with all kinds of needs that hadn't been whisked away at all. Of course, this did not apply to those over 65s because everyone had indeed forgotten them. Inconveniently, they had forgotten to forget themselves. This made the society so much harder to live in for the people with disabilities because they were only allowed to be disabled as far as the NDIS paid for. Yet they had not been whisked away to NDIS land and had to shop, go to school, work, access healthcare and live somewhere. Reality, it would seem, was what was forgotten. So the NDIS was supposed to support them and take care of them so they could live well and in society no one had told society, or indeed the states. Then in a phenomenon, just like the Tulip Revolution, everyone wanted to be on the NDIS. This very much upset the calculators of these things, as they had only calculated an allowed number. This was not that number. This number was incalculable. In a total miscalculation, a fuck-up of all fuck-ups, they failed to design the NDIS and regulate it. Though there was much talk about human rights, which are written down, and much talk on vulnerable people and safeguarding, nobody could agree what a disability was, what a support was. They spoke so much of choice and control that they forgot that all people, and perhaps especially more vulnerable people, need to be set up for success and not be forced to make unsafe choices that should never have existed. Support staff were so undermined as just cleaners they had no other qualifications, and this very much upset those that did. Again, magically, the NDIS had disappeared everyone's reality of a disability, 
and the care beyond washing people evaporated. Where is the quality, where is the safeguarding and capacity building? And why have these new lives not manifested for all, of course? For those who had no care at all, it had made a difference. And for those who won the lottery and chanced good staff and were equipped with good knowledge, but this was more by luck than by design. Some had decided that they needed in order to live a good life, a diamond ring or cryptocurrency or to shop at Kmart, whilst others wallowed in bureaucracy with nothing, not even a Meals on Wheels to show for it. After much talking, it was decided that regulations needed to be written down so all could get the same and end the Great Lottery. It was decided that unqualified, unregistered, uninsured, with no security clearance, perhaps wasn't the best idea at all. After all, the people couldn't believe they hadn't all been registered and that we hadn't known who they were or where they were. It seemed a little farcical to be true, yet, astonishingly, a small group of rebels, the self-managed disability advocates, objected to these changes. Despite the thousands who had contributed to talking and many millions spent on listening, they said that they hadn't talked enough unless they were able to dictate to all the people their way. They can't have listened if their way wasn't the way forward, which was to do nothing at all. They, being the ones with the loudest voices and the best clickbait, pleased the media, who loved the clicks and very much liked to look official by disagreeing with the government. So, a great bill was written to fix the problem. This bill was the first of its kind ever to enshrine all of the principles of the human rights, yet they still said their human rights were threatened. The taxpayer, wrapped up in regulations, binding their lives, didn't readily understand this choice and control weapon. They didn't have choice of working or where to live or how to live their lives. They didn't have choice of which school or if they should pay tax. I shall say also, they did not have choice in intimate pleasures, however much they demanded it from Centrelink or the ATO. So, this was very hard to understand because the disability advocates demanded inclusion and the people wondered where they wanted to be included and to which society. This one would seem far different than the one they speak of. The NDIS costs more than the healthcare for the whole nation. It rivals what defence costs and will soon cost more than pensions for 2.7 million people at a time when the cost of living is frighteningly changing the quality of everyone's lives. At a time when we have housing shortages and families are living in parks, when people no longer have job security, the reality is the NDIS is not sustainable. Not when it is growing at an alarming rate and still we have people left behind in an NDIS lottery. While some have bought cars, paid their rent and bills, and bought diamond rings and very expensive cuddles, some are lacking basic needs. It alarms me. We don't hear of this as the priority, that there is any denial of reality here is astonishing for our fellow human beings. That the states could ponder why the ramping at hospitals is quite so bad when they have cut off all services for mental health and disability for everyone, not on the NDIS. It's criminal. The contribution to domestic violence in our community as a consequence is undeniable. They shoved anyone they could into the NDIS bucket, into a system that was unqualified and unprepared for the diversity of needs they were evading their responsibility for. The lack of health equity that contributes greatly to comorbidities and cost of care in a supposed non-medicalised system, a system that denies people have health or clinical needs, and then has the audacity to speak of safeguards, that has non-medical assessments to facilitate needs by non-medical professionals, armed only with their pre-printed assessment sheets. The railroading of the majority of the disability community by some disability representative organisations by those who have clear conflict of interests and alliances that scream agenda, who have spoken for and without the voices of their community, 
ignoring the ply of the over 65s, ignoring the voices of the intellectually disabled community, because they can. They can speak about us without us, and they do. The media who quote them as a whole of, as the entire disability community, because they can't be bothered to listen as long as they get their headline and their clickbait, who are too afraid to be journalists and speak against someone with a disability, who demonstrate quite loudly, as do others, that disability discrimination is a mere lip service. Inclusion cannot ever happen if we continue to discriminate and treat people with a disability like children with children's rules. It's why it's so important that any fraud and any misspending is spoken of and not shut down. It does not affect the disability reputation. What does is the lack of support to stop it. The will to deny that someone with a disability is capable. It's capable of and has done such a thing. The instance of pleasure as a human right both alarmed and amused many housewives across the land, yet fortunately they weren't compelled quite enough or had become accustomed to the absence of pleasure. They haven't turned up at Parliament House demanding theirs yet. Recent banning of intimate services led disability representatives to conclude that the government quite literally didn't and wasn't ever going to give a fuck. People with disability are people first, capable of everything any person is. Some need support to get there, and some find their way in their own way, as do we all. But I resent the low bar of expectations. In fact, I wholeheartedly reject it. However, I would like to point out that the absence of the assistance in budgeting and a robust framework did not set anyone up for success. People being people with large amounts of money need a framework and oversight, such as it does speak of in the UNCRPD. As we are calling for this to be implemented, so should this oversight be remedied. In no other sector of society would this even be of being the case. It was unfair and reckless. It is almost as if the government wanted it to blow out and fail. Thus, I blame the lack of structure and regulation for the fraud and misuse and rorting had the expensive computer systems functioned like anything in our modern digital age does None of it should have been possible. Surely there is blame to place and responsibility there. The system is that complicated and so happens that it requires interpreters and most can be forgiven for getting the information wrong. As such, it is a common theme that different stakeholders have different perceptions and understanding and disagree with one another. At this point, it is not sustainable in several areas. Firstly, from the point of view of people with disability who need more than winning a plan. They need there to be substance in the plan. It's what the plan does and its content that is important. Too many have insufficient care and proper care that affects their longevity and quality of life until their plans achieve a holistic outcome that is future-proof, life-sustaining and life-enabling until people can live their lives free from the worry of their care and the NDIS. The NDIS is unsustainable to them. From a government perspective, it is not sustainable economically or from the viewpoint of risk. The crime-related human trafficking, drug running and gang-related activity is a significant risk to society at large. From an economic viewpoint, there is a red line of cost that given the fraud and given the lack of consistent outcome threatens the scheme from an affordability standpoint. We can't afford for it to cost so much it bankrupts the country, nor can we afford for it to cost so much it affects the sustainability of other schemes, such as health, education, and housing. As this disenfranchises and affects the human rights of everyone and is counterproductive to inclusion. From a provider standpoint, the scheme is not tenable. It's not profitable, it is estimated there are anything between 150,000 and perhaps as high as 250,000 unregistered providers. I ask you, how many are paying tax? There are only around 10,000 registered providers in a bastardized marketplace, which is an affront to competition laws, unfairly favoring those who operate without regulations and less costs. In a healthcare setting, where quality and safeguards equate to lives, this is outrageous. 
Many providers, both registered and unregistered, have been holding up the NDIS and sacrificing what little profits they have. In filling the gaps in care, gaps in plans, and gaps in understanding of what a support is, and often acting as pseudo-guardians and providing support way beyond their expectations. The previous system was government interwoven with large, deep pockets. Everything was provided. This is a capitalist system, and those costs need to be defined, recognised and counted. They were not correctly accounted for when bringing in the NDIS. The workforce is at failure levels. The work is sporadic, hard, unsupervised, with extreme risk and sometimes dangerous situations. Without acknowledgement or protections, staff are often paid below award wages and employed in conditions outside of fair work practice. Being forced to breach health and safety laws in often toxic and hostile environments. The deprofessionalisation of this role, coupled with the increase in risk, is forcing many out of the industry. This must be re-evaluated if it is to be remedied. Simply put, no staff, no care. However, fancy your policies or big your budgets are. Again, the workforce is providing on average an extra 30% in unpaged time, donated time to participants. Yet, astonishingly, there is debate over if we need reform. We have a bill that needs to pass and sooner rather than later. We have providers watching closely, deciding if they will close their doors. Many hundreds, including some big names, already have closed their doors. Unfortunately, the love and the reform has yet to reach the providers, and all that has transpired is more pressure. What is worse is the division between providers and participants, well, their representative organisations, well, some of them. And most of those seem to have an overwhelmingly biased interest in self-management, shutting down many other voices. Something has gone wrong here. Something has gone very wrong, especially when we are approaching co-design that we will all have to live with. The recent bombardment of Sukha's office by certain groups has distorted the view of the disability sector. And sadly, not all are as well informed as our current Minister Bill Shorten is on issues and they are easily manipulated, especially when it can be used as political fodder. Yet the irony is the Liberal government, and let's not forget an election is looming close, may not seek to cap, but is more likely to cut and co-design, well, <laughs> that'll be off the agenda and in the hands of those who do not understand disability. Politics is a complex game to play, and such a gambit that held up the bill was a serious miscalculation, in my opinion. Whilst moral liability and social policy conflicts with financial metrics in that we get the rights we can afford, identity politics and extremism, which is currently a global phenomenon, is holding many governments to ransom. In an age when co-design is a door opened potentially now for all Australians to have a more democratic society. Radical system loathing identity politics serves only a few and is untenable as beyond disruption. There are no solutions that are viable in the world we have today. People need good leadership, but reasonable and whole nation sensitive realities will determine if that looks like walking with or doing for kind of leadership. Despite cancel culture, one has to be courageous enough to speak out and speak up or watch the train wreck and the lost opportunity to make history or prevent its reoccurrence. It is a brave parliamentarian who chooses in the name of democracy to walk that fine line between co-design and leadership and maintain a democracy and system that serves its purpose and all who need it. These realities have played out overseas in the UK, for instance, and the results have already been written, and we ignore them at our peril, as they no longer have a world-leading system, whilst we still could. This current situation is a critical social issue, and one that has no tolerance for the recent political grandstanding. This is people's lives, their very lives, 
and any political bollocks just serves to show us how little regard you have for us and what a silly game it all really is, rather than the serious business of respecting the importance of the issue. This is bigger than anyone's career or soundbite. This is what government exists for. If it can't come together on this, it demonstrates the weakness and futility of the system we hold dear. I implore you all to share the Tim Tams and find a way together. Like many other things, such as real estate or dot com and the like, the NDIS has become such a gold rush that it has become a bubble. It needs very careful and responsible handling, or the outcomes will be catastrophic. There are three possible outcomes. One, the system fails and it goes back to the states, or providers assume the role and institutionalization wins over human rights. Second, the entire financial system has to change to reflect humanity and to abolish scarcity. This is unlikely for many generations yet. Lastly, the system is reinvigorated and adapts a new model to suit the NDIS vision, from a linear to a circular enterprise model. Sustainability is entirely the key here. It is sustainable for government. Is it sustainable for the providers? And is it sustainable for participants? For the last one, that will depend very much on outcomes. Are participants able to live beyond their care needs and choose their lives, regardless of their disability? Where possible to do this, we must not repeat the farce that came before. No band-aids and no painting over dry rot. We must genuinely and bravely reform. There must be co-design, and it must include providers and participants not just a small privileged set of people who dominate the government's ear and say they speak for everyone. It must be nothing about us without all of us. There are significant gaps in reality that need a bridge built outside of the NDIS system, throughout government and society, in order to achieve that goal. These are critical foundational supports. They are an essential part of that, but let's not forget health equity access and disability awareness. Remember our hospitals are the provider of last resort to prevent a tsunami of participants with nowhere to go. It's time they acknowledge their responsibilities and obligations and stop being the deadbeat patriarch in the picture. Ideology must give way to honest conversation if we are ever to attain the goals we seek all policy and talk and disruption will continue to be the only outcome achieved. This is a system the taxpayer funds, and they do so on the basis they believe in it, and they believe it's a system that could be needed by any one of us. Like Medicare, it's an essential service that paints a civil society, a progressive and fair society, and the kind we wish to live in Everyone must be considered in the NDIS, as this is a nation-building scheme and it affects the whole nation. I don't have all the answers. We're not the ones that will suit everyone. But I do know that we are in a right pickle. No matter what is felt about providers, there are so many that do such good work who are leaving irreplaceable people. I know we need registration, yet our task force must have gone to Brazil on the junket because they seem to have disappeared. I know that everyone is not going to be happy. If we make the most vocal happy, it could exasperate the current chaos. We had our time to prove ourselves, and we were proven to be like the rest of the population, in need of guidance and protection and regulation. Sometimes it's a few that spoil it, and it's protecting the system, and sometimes regulation saves lives. What I do know is that the absence of it doesn't save any lives. Denial is a river in Egypt, and it is what it is. The cowboys need running out of town, and we need massive reform to save NDIS town. It will take the whole nation and the inclusion of the states and territories in order to pull this off. We need plans that aren't short-sighted, that can be carried with a person with the insight of their life ahead to ensure health ability and opportunity and access to the whole world and the whole of what life has to offer. Everyone's choices need to be respected 
and there is no place for rigid idealism or political grandstanding. At the core of this are people. They are our neighbours, our friends and our family. We owe them better than this. It's time for all of us to speak up in support of the NDIS, in support of each other as a whole community and work together. No demonisation of participants or providers or support staff or the government. It is what it is and we just need to fix it so that we know what we know and know what we don't know. We need to share information. We need to put our egos in our back pocket and stop panicking and simply get on with the job. It is a sector of many stakeholders and it needs to work for all concerned. As much as I could get technical and list all the things I think should happen, the one ingredient to the NDIS's success now is us. It's you, so speak up. Though reform has thus far been mostly harmless, it hasn't been totally harmless by any means. For the common good, it is time that we share the one agenda to make the NDIS the envy of the world. But more importantly, it's the vision, the shared vision of outcomes for all that enable someone living with a disability to live a meaningful life of their choosing as beloved Australians. No decent soul wishes to go to bed at night knowing their neighbour is cold or hungry or with nowhere to call home. No one wishes anyone any struggle. It should be what makes us Australian. It is the resounding reason why the NDIS must succeed and why it must be sustainable for all Australians as the one inclusive community.